One of the most controversial uses of point of care ultrasound is its use in cardiac arrest. In this video, we're going to discuss the nuances of POCUS and cardiac arrest. And by the end of the video, you should understand a simple evidence-based algorithm that you can use on your next shift. Let's start with the four uses of POCUS and cardiac arrest, listed here in order from the most supporting evidence to the least. Number one, reversible causes. Number two, pulse checks. Number three, procedural guidance. And number four, prognosis. We won't discuss procedural guidance much in this lecture, but it includes central lines, arterial lines, and pericardiosynthesis. First, I need to mention that POCUS should only be used in cardiac arrest for the subset of PEA and asystole. If you have ventricular fibrillation or pulseless VTAC, these patients need cardioversion. Let's discuss reversible causes. There are three big ones, pericardial effusion and tamponade, RV strain, and number three, fine or occult VFib. I recognize that there are more than three reversible causes of cardiac arrest. However, these are the best three for POCUS, starting with pericardial effusion and cardiac tamponade. If you perform a pericardiosynthesis, these patients have about a 15% survival to hospital discharge. Number two is RV dilation suggesting massive pulmonary embolus. If you administer thrombolytics, these patients have about a 7% survival to hospital discharge. And number three, fine or occult ventricular fibrillation. These patients require cardioversion. And each of these account for about 5% of cardiac arrest. For all of these diagnoses, you'll use a cardiac or phased array probe in the subcostal view during a rhythm check. If you don't have a good subcostal window, you could rapidly move to a peristernal long axis view, but remember, a maximum of 10 second pause. So realistically, you only have about eight seconds of the probe on the chest. And you can try to obtain these images during CPR, but you'll likely only see a pericardial effusion or tamponade. Here's an example of obtaining cardiac views during CPR. It's really hard to detect anything other than a pericardial effusion, which is not seen here. Here's an example of tamponade leading to cardiac arrest. See my other video on pericardial effusions for more details on this diagnosis, though. People often ask me, is RV dilation always a sign of acute pulmonary embolus? Well, there's a PIG study from 2017 that showed that very quickly after cardiac arrest, the RV will dilate, usually from a combination of poor forward flow from the LV and venous pooling into the right heart. So ideally, you can perform your POCUS exam prior to the cardiac arrest, and you have to take a little bit of caution when you use POCUS later in the cardiac arrest. But if you're unsure, you can always add a DVT scan to increase your specificity because about 85% of arrests due to acute pulmonary embolus will also have a DVT. And finally, onto the third and final reversible cause that you can see on POCUS is occult ventricular fibrillation. This describes the presence of ventricular fibrillation that is not readily identifiable on standard ECG monitoring. This is why a lot of EMS systems always shock asystole once, because what's the downside? Here is a great example of ventricular fibrillation versus asystole. POCUS should be able to visualize this fibrillation of the myocardium in patients with occult VFib to facilitate earlier defibrillation. One study published earlier this year showed that about 5% of PEA asystole patients had occult VFib. But interestingly, even when recognized and treated appropriately, they still had outcomes that were similar to the true PEA in asystole. Here's another example of ventricular fibrillation in the subcostal view. Notice this myocardium here fibrillating. This is a sign the patient needs defibrillation. Here's one more example of ventricular fibrillation. You'll notice that the myocardium here is fibrillating, and you can also see it up here. Now that we've discussed the three reversible causes of cardiac arrest on ultrasound, let's move on to pulse checks. It's important to mention that ultrasound should not be prolonging pulse checks, and there's two interventions we can do to minimize the amount of time that the probe is on the chest, with the first being pre-pause imaging. This is the idea that you'll place the probe in the subcostal or subxiphoid position during CPR to find your window before the rhythm check, save your clip, and then interpret the image after CPR resumes. You should also have a towel in your non-dominant hand so you can wipe off the gel. And finally, have someone count down from 10 during the rhythm check. And so when they hit the two second mark, your probe should be off the patient and you can resume compressions by the 10 second mark.
Why should we use ultrasound for pulse checks? Well, there's many studies to show that manual pulse checks are terrible, and I'll list them in the show notes. And arterial lines are great. However, most patients don't have them in the emergency department. And so that leaves POCUS as the main way to look for a pulse, the most accurate way as well. Let me show you the evidence. In two separate studies, POCUS pulse checks were shown to be faster and more accurate. You'll notice that POCUS took less than half the amount of time as a manual pulse check, and it was incredibly more accurate. You'll notice that 54% for the manual pulse checks is almost a coin flip if the pulse is present or not. So how do you actually perform a POCUS pulse check? Well, on the second rhythm check, you'll switch to a linear probe and you'll place the linear probe transversely on the mid neck. You'll find the carotid artery marked here as a red star. You'll use gentle compression until the IJ is completely compressed, marked by a blue star, and you'll look for pulsations indicating a sonographic pulse. And in cases where ROSC has been achieved, the artery will not completely compress and should display pulsatility. You can do this as a femoral artery as well, but no study has ever compared the different sites. And I do not recommend using color Doppler. It's too complicated. Just use compression here. Here's an example of a POCUS pulse check, and you'll notice with gentle compression, there's a very clear pulsation of the carotid artery, indicating sonographic pulse. If there is no pulsations of the artery or collapse completely, that would show that there is no pulse present. Again, we won't discuss procedural ultrasound in this lecture, so you can see my other videos for more details on the procedures, but let's move on to prognosis. The best evidence we have here is a huge trial in 2016 called the REASON trial. 20 hospitals participated, and this is where a lot of my information from the lecture is from. But to summarize the study, if you had cardiac activity on your first ultrasound in the ED, you had about 4% survival to hospital discharge, whereas if you had no cardiac activity on the first ultrasound, you had less than a 1% survival to hospital discharge. This was only three patients out of 530. So the takeaways from the study show that isolated valve fluttering or myocardial twitching does not indicate a perfusing rhythm. And number two, patients without cardiac activity had a very low likelihood of survival, but not zero. So this brings up a really important point about the definition of cardiac activity. You need to see movement of the myocardium. This is defined by a change in the size of the ventricular cavity and synchronized movement of the ventricular wall. So this image on the left here, you'll notice that there is no change in the size of the ventricular cavity and no synchronized movement of the ventricular wall. As opposed to over here, you can see that the ventricular size is changing and there's synchronized movement. There was one great study that looked at different doctors and how they interpret cardiac activity versus cardiac standstill. And you'll see here that there's a lot of variability, especially in the ones that have valve fluttering. So let's look at a few of them here. Would you say that there's cardiac activity in this clip? Well, there's very subtle valve fluttering and many people, 37 people out of this group, thought there was cardiac activity when there was not. Remember, don't take valve fluttering in isolation as a sign of cardiac activity. Would you say that there's cardiac activity here? Remember, you need a change in the ventricular size as well as synchronized movement of the myocardium. And yes, I see myocardial contraction here, but there are still 10 docs that thought this was cardiac standstill. How about now? Would you say this is cardiac activity? Well, this can confuse people, but this is just actually bagging the patient and the heart is actually not moving. It's just the lungs pushing in the heart. So this is actual cardiac standstill. Most people didn't miss this one, but if you look at the right side of the heart, you'll notice that there's swirling in the atria, and this is a very common sign when you actually have cardiac standstill. You've seen this one before. This one's ventricular fibrillation. Notice that there is movement of the myocardium as seen here, but it is very disorganized and chaotic, and this patient needs defibrillation. 
Now we're going to move on from advanced ultrasound to cutting edge ultrasound. This is not an evidence free zone, but it's rather an evidence light zone. The concept of pseudo PEA has been around since around 2003, and there's been a big increase in publications over the last five years, but it's a term that's not used by the American Heart Association. The pseudo PEA means that you have sonographic cardiac activity, but without a palpable pulse. But remember, your fingers are terrible at determining if there's a pulse. In the RESEN trial that we mentioned earlier, about 50% of the PEA patients actually had cardiac activity on ultrasound. This excellent graphic shows PEA is a spectrum, starting with true PEA over here, where you have organized electrical cardiac rhythm, but no cardiac activity on ultrasound, you don't feel a pulse, and if you had an arterial line, your arterial line would read zero as opposed to hypotension, where you should still have cardiac motion on ultrasound and a palpable pulse, and if you had an arterial line, maybe your systolics would be in the 80s. Pseudo PEA is in the middle. Now you have cardiac motion on ultrasound, but no palpable pulse, and these patients are more like profound shock state. They have better survival to hospital discharge. And interestingly, ACLS treats true PEA and pseudo PEA as one single pathway, and then just throws an asystole into the PEA asystole algorithm. True PEA is actually cardiac arrest with dismal outcomes. You'll provide CPR and bolus epinephrine, and it makes sense to restart the heart, whereas pseudo PEA is more of a severe sh shock state with some cardiac output, though it's not true cardiac arrest and CPR with bolus epinephrine may be harmful. So to summarize, pseudo PEA is actually a profound shock state, not actually cardiac arrest. And pseudo PEA versus true PEA is associated with higher rates of ROSC and survival. And how do you detect pseudo PEA? Again, you don't use your fingers. You have to use a POCUS pulse check or an arterial line maybe end tidal CO2, but that's not as well studied. And you can consider if pseudo PEA is present, then treat it as profound shock rather than cardiac arrest. So you don't resume CPR, you don't bolus epinephrine, you'll start an epinephrine or norepinephrine infusion as you would with profound septic shock. This is from the RESEN trial when they retrospectively reviewed the data and found that continuous IV adrenergic agents had higher rates of ROSC. And in fact, I was planning to do a whole lecture on pseudo PEA versus true PEA until I came across a video that explains it way better than I ever could. So if you're interested, please check out this link uh, by, to a video by Dr. Rob Samard. So I've covered a lot of information. Now let's try and organize it into a very simplified algorithm that you can take to your next shift. So let's say you have a patient that's crashing, they're hypotensive, this would be the place where you'd perform the rush exam. This is the rapid ultrasound for shock and hypotension. See my other lecture for more details on this. But at some point, this sustained a cardiac arrest, and now they're in PEA or asystole. Someone would likely start ACLS with chest compressions, and if you haven't already, while the chest compressions are ongoing, you'll do a tamponade evaluation. Remember, other things are hard to see besides tamponade. And then finally, at your rhythm check, you look for the three reversible causes of cardiac arrest here, and you have less than 10 seconds. If you find tamponade, you'd perform pericardiocentesis. If you had RV dilation plus or minus a DVT, you'd provide thrombolytics. And if you had VFib, you'd shock them at this point. Say you had none of the three, you continue with your ACLS. And at the second rhythm check, you'd use your linear probe and place it on the neck to look for a carotid pulse. Remember, the fingers are terrible, so you need to use ultrasound to look for a pulse. If there's no pulse, you continue ACLS. And then subsequent rhythm checks, you'd use your linear probe to look at the pulse. You don't need to look at the heart anymore unless you actually have ROSC. Let's say at the third rhythm check, you actually have a pocus carotid pulse that indicates ROSC. And now you'd stop CPR, insert an arterial line and consider an epinephrine drip. But what if there's no pocus pulse at this rhythm check? Well, you can continue this for as long as you need to, recognizing the longer you go, the less chance there is for ROSC. And at some point, you'll terminate your resuscitation. So let's run through an actual case that I had in the emergency department of cardiac arrest where the paramedics reported PEA. On the first rhythm check, you see no cardiac activity. You see atrial swirling of blood but you also don't see any reversible causes such as tamponade, RV enlargement, or VFib. 
Although you now know this patient has less than 1% chance of leaving the hospital, he's relatively young with a witness arrest, so you continue ACLS. On the second rhythm check, you use the linear probe on the neck to look for a sonographic pulse. You detect a pulse with ultrasound. You tell the team to hold compressions. Since you have obtained ROSC, you now take the cardiac probe and look at the heart again to find cardiac activity with an expectedly reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. At this time, you place an arterial line with ultrasound and start an epinephrine drip to keep your maps above your map goal. All right, to summarize my entire lecture of POCUS and cardiac arrest, remember you'll use POCUS only in PEA and asystole, and it's great for the three reversible causes, including pericardial effusion, fine or occult V-fib, and it's pretty good for a dilated right heart if used early in arrest. It is useful for prognostication, especially if there's no cardiac activity seen. You'll wanna use pre-pause imaging to shorten pulse checks, which involves finding your window before chest compressions are held for the rhythm check, and then keeping your probe on the chest less than eight seconds, wiping off the gel, and interpreting your images after chest compressions have resumed. To determine if there's cardiac activity, you'll look for myocardial movement, not valve movement. Number four, pulse checks are terrible. Please use POCUS or an arterial line to determine if the patient has a pulse or ROSC. And number five, the cutting edge one is gonna be treating true PEA and pseudo PEA differently, where pseudo PEA, you'll, you'll hold the chest compressions and give an epinephrine infusion rather than bolus epinephrine. And then finally, the new frontier, of cardiac arrest is going to be TEE, which we'll describe later.